iOS for uh, giving us the platform to discuss uh, the DS2 report under the uh, aegis of the iOS. So I would be covering the diagnostic uh, tests, both clinical and uh, investigational that we uh, do. I have no financial interests. So when you look at uh, diagnostic tests, apart from our clinical evaluation, you have n number of tests that can be done and that are available now in the market, which helps you categorize dry eye. But you, do you need all these tests? Probably the answer is no. You do need a couple of them, but you need to use them judiciously. So this is probably the most important uh, slide in my presentation. It basically talks about how you would want to approach this thing. So you are, when a patient comes to you, the first thing that you would ask is a set of triaging questions to identify whether he has dry eye or he has some kind of a mimic which uh, is similar to dry eye. Once that is done, then you put him through the risk factor analysis and then you give the symptom scores and then you look at the tests which are called as the homeostasis markers. So let's go through uh, the questionnaire or the triaging questions. Basically, these are some of the so normal questions that we ask our patients who come to us as to since when does he have the discomfort? Was it associated with any other uh, issue, especially if it was associated with, say, with the conjunctivitis and following which he developed dryness or it was associated with a drug reaction or it was associated with any change in medications that he had over the, over the last couple of months. Generally, if it's medicine related, it's supposed to be within three months or if the patient has and itching, which is which is the predominant factor, which indicates allergy to be more of a role, uh, play more of a role rather than dry eye. Even though we do know allergy and dry eye can coexist, but once you have gone through the dry eye questions and you you feel that yes, this patient has dry eye, and you want to evaluate the patient further, you give the symptomatology score or the symptom question questionnaire. And once you do that, then you go on to the homeostasis markers. The homeostasis markers basically are the non-invasive or the invasive tear breakup, which tells you about the stability of the tears the tear osmolarity and the ocular surface staining score. Now, this is what has been recommended by the DS2. But in a practical uh, situation, in a real world scenario, not everybody would have the uh, option of using a tear osmolarity uh, osmometer because it is an expensive uh, tool. So in an Indian context, uh, it would be probably uh, we would be adding the Shermer's strips to this uh, diagnostic test kit to give us our uh, diagnosis of dry eye. So when you look at uh, the questionnaire, uh, it needs to be a validated questionnaire and generally it's administered at the time that the patient uh, starts his uh, evaluation in the clinic. And you have n number of uh, questionnaires which are available in the uh, in the uh, published literature. But what has been recommended by the DS2 is the OSDI and the DEQ5. You also have the option of using something called as a Sande symptom score, which could be used to assess the comfort of the patient pre and post interventions. The next important thing was the homeostasis test, of which the first one was the tear film stability. So you have two ways of measuring it, one using a non-invasive method and one using the invasive fluorescein breakup time. It's preferable to use the non-invasive because fluorescein will alter the tear film stability. Having said that, it, uh, a non-invasive test is expensive. The normal values between a non-invasive test, what is taken is around 10 seconds. And this has about an 80% sensitivity and specificity. The machines like the Oculus Keratograph can give you the non-invasive breakup time and it also gives you a baggage of other uh, information in terms of the tear meniscus height, nebography and redness scores. So this is how a printout from a keratograph will look where it shows you the area where the tear is breaking up faster and it gives you the average in terms of the first breakup happened at what time and the average breakup and it also classifies the dry eye based on the tear breakup scale. You also have equipment called, uh, like the ocular surface analyzer, which adds on an interference uh, fringe pattern to the diagnostic kit. And it gives you lipid layer thickness, tear meniscus height, uh, breakup tat patterns, nebography, and uh, redness score. And this is how the printout appears, where it gives you uh, something like a traffic signal uh, like approach, where the green is normal, the yellow is uh, borderline, and the red is an abnormal uh, value. So it becomes very easy for even the patient to understand that his value is borderline or his value is abnormal. You have uh, investigations like the thermography and the tear evaporation rate. These are more in terms of research-based tools. They've not come into clinical practice as such. So at this point of time, the recommendation is that the non-invasive breakup is better than the fluorescein breakup. And the cutoff value that is uh, to be used is 10 seconds. Coming to the next part in the homeostasis was the tear osmolar osmolarity. And we have the tear lab osmometer, which can help us identify the osmolarity of tears. Uh, the normal cutoff value is supposed to be around 308 milliosmoles per liter. But what is important is the difference between both the eyes. If the value between both the eyes is more than 8, 
uh, difference is more than eight, then it indicates an unstability of film. The value between both the eyes, what you would take is the higher value when you say a cutoff of three hundred and eight. So uh, it does show uh, a reasonable amount of uh, uh, statistically significant results in as far as the Jogren's patient is concerned. Uh, and uh, the inter-eye variability of more than eight is considered as a loss of homeostasis. So the next part in the homeostasis marker was the surface staining. And again, when you look at published literature, you have from the von Bischoff scoring system to the latest ocular surface scoring system given by the Jogren's uh, International Study Group. You have uh, various ways of grading the staining. It is important to follow the same grading system throughout, so you know what you're dealing with. So this is uh, taken from the publication in AJO 2010 from the uh, Jogren's International Registry, where they grade less than one uh, between one to five spots as a grade one corneal staining, between six to thirty spots as a grade two. And more than 30 spots as a grade three staining. Now, in addition, if there is confluent staining, if there is filaments, or if there is a central visual axis involvement, it is given one one point extra. So you have a total of six points for the cornea. For the conjunctiva, for both for the nasal and the temporal conjunctiva, you have three points based on the distribution of the staining pattern. So you get a total of uh, 12 points per eye. And this could be used as a useful tool to follow up patients. So this is the representative picture of the conjunctival staining of a grade one, which shows uh, between 10 to 33 spots, a grade two, which shows about 33 to 100 spots, and a grade three, which is more than 100. You're not actually individually counting counting the spots. It's just the pattern and the patch of confluence that tells you an idea whether it is grade two or grade three. The next, in our uh, real world scenario, instead of the osmolarity, we said you'd be looking at Schirmer's. So when you look at pure volume measurements, the two tests that stand out are the Schirmer's and the Tiermeniscus height. A Schirmer's value of less than five in five minutes is obviously uh, indicative of dry eye. A value less than 10 can be borderline. You still need to evaluate the person uh, further. The range of specificity and sensitivity is around 70%. A Tiermeniscus height can be measured with non-invasive measures like the uh, keratograph or the OSA. Or it could be measured once you put the fluorescein and you look at the patient in the slit lab, you can actually evaluate the tear film height. What is important when you're measuring with a non-invasive equipment is to be careful that you don't measure the fluid above the calysis. Because if there is a conjunctival fold, your uh, tear meniscus height might artificially look higher. So what is recommended is a non-invasive uh, tear meniscus height measurement would be preferable. If you are using Schirmer's, it's preferable to use Schirmer's without anesthetic, especially if you're dealing with Jogren's syndrome. However, if you're dealing with a predominant meibomian gland dysfunction, this might still be normal. Coming to the uh, evaporative dry eye or the MGD, uh, you have a set of clinical and diagnostic tests. The clinical test would be based on lead margin abnormality, quality and expressibility of the meibom. The diagnostic test would be to look at the anatomy of the meibomian gland and to measure the lipid layer thickness. So when you're looking at quality of meibom, you have a score of 0 to 24, and 0 is clear, and 3 is toothpaste-like, and these are for 8 glands for both the eyes. As far as the expressibility is concerned, it's measured in 5 glands, where 0 is all glands are patent, and 3 is no glands are patent, and then you add up for both the eyes. A lipid view is an interfer interferometry-based tool, which can help us identify the lipid layer thickness. Uh, in a more quantitative manner. The OSA gives a, a range of uh, the lipid layer, whereas uh, LipiView gives you the act, uh, absolute value as such. Uh, it also gives you the uh, mebography and it is able to give you the blink pattern in terms of how many times the blink was partial and how many times it was complete. Coming to mebography standalone equipments uh, by itself, any infrared camera can help you image the mebomian uh, glands. You don't need very high uh, definition uh, equipments. Even your uh, auto ref can actually help you image the glands. So when you're looking at bibomian glands and uh, looking at the anatomy of it, uh, Arita et al. gave a grading of uh, grade one of uh, MGD dropout was if it is less than 30%. Grade two was uh, one third to two third loss and grade three was more than 30, more than two third loss of uh, uh, bibomian gland uh, structures. And now, now you do have automated grading systems, which, is, which makes it a lot more easier. So this is an example of a mebography with a moderate dropout. And when you look at uh, this, you can see a complete, uh, almost a complete dropout. But what is important is mebography alone cannot tell you about the extent of uh, mebomian gland dysfunction because it's only an anatomy. It doesn't tell you about the physiology. So you need to combine the imaging of the glands. You need to assess the lipid layer and you need to look at the expressibility of the lipids before you come to the diagnosis of uh, mebomian gland dysfunction and severity. Uh, coming to the T4 uh, uh, classification, which Gita spoke about, it basically speaks of the timing of the break of the uh, fluorescein. It speaks of the place of the break and it speak, speaks of the pattern of the break. So if you look at the figure A and D, 
this is what you would probably get in something or someone who has who has an aqueous deficiency dry eye a spot break or a dimple break is seen in patients with what they call as decreased wettability in this basically even when the tear film moves up from uh, as you blink it doesn't uh, completely coat the surface and that's why it's called as decreased wettability and once the tear film forms and then there is a random break of the tear film it's supposed to be a uh, evaporative dry eye the reason they have classified it as this pattern is because they associated uh, the aqueous deficiency with a decrease in aqueous tears and you need to supplement the tears if there is a decreased wettability there's an issue with the mucin 16 which needs to be uh, addressed either with uh, repepamide or dapaprosol or if it's an evaporative dry eye you would need to look at uh, replacement of the lipid layer other investigational tools would be in terms of ocular surface inflammation which could be either in the form of redness scores uh, which can be used to follow up or it could be in the form of confocal which can tell you the increased uh, inflammatory cells in the epithelium and the anterior corneal stroma or it could be the use of uh, available kits like the mmp9 kits which are there but these are all non specific markers of inflammation not specific to dry eye per se uh, at this point of time these are only investigational tools confocal can also be used to look at squamous metaplasia nerve changes and congenital goblet cell to address dry eye in a more holistic manner and obviously if you get <clears> the sensitivity of the cornea it helps us understand the discrepancy between uh, symptoms and signs of the patient uh the blink dynamics also play a major role especially if somebody has an incomplete blink it can cause surface staining and exposure keratopathy so we need to look at all these patterns so to conclude uh the tear tests for the tear homeostasis are the most important of the tests that we do a dry eye can occur even though there's no staining of the ocular surface example like in an ngd patient there is no single gold standard sign or symptom that correl correlates with the severity of the dry eye and you need to have a combination of symptoms and tests to help us diagnose and grade the severity and help plan treatment strategies thank you thank you dr baskar for a very 